machine turned on here. Okay, very, very good. All right, praise God. Uh, uh, do we have any uh, announcements or joys and concerns that we need to talk about this morning? What's that? Oh, it's Melinda's birthday. Well, happy birthday, Melinda. Yeah. Okay. Oh, ah, very good. Yeah, ha happy anniversary. <laughs> 62 years. All right. Okay. Did you have something? Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bob, for that. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to share that or just an unspoken request? I just wanted to look at the business and family. My mom sent his brother in the business and died in the country. And rolled in Friday. Okay. Uh, Angie's, that would be your uncle. Yeah, Angie's uncle, uh, the, the good, uh, Vince Goodwin, passed away of prostate cancer. So keep the that family lifted up and uh, uh, anything else joys or concerns or announcements <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't hear that <laughs> <laughs> We do have a couple exciting things happening uh, here at the church. On Sunday, April 2nd, uh, we're having uh, Michaela Dunn, the program coordinator from Camp Wesley Woods, is going to come and make a presentation here. Uh, she's even got a video uh, about camp. And she's going to try to get the kids fired up about going to camp. And um, we might, if depending on the weather, or even thinking about uh, cooking s'mores afterwards, or maybe hot dogs uh, afterwards in the parking lot out behind the church. Uh, but anyway, bring your kids and come to church that Sunday. The good news is with that, you don't have to hear me preach. She's going to take the whole uh, time to present the camp. And so I'm excited about it. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there we go. I didn't hear that either, Bev. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, be sure to put that on your cal calendar Sunday, April 2nd. It's 3rd, excuse me, April 3rd. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Anything else that we need to talk about? Well, during Lent, we're doing a couple of things differently. Uh, we're doing the responses to the responsive readings. And uh, uh, that was actually I, uh, Chris's brainchild. I have never done that before. And uh, it's always good to do something different. It's in our hymnals, so we should be doing it. And so that's new and different for us. The other thing is that we're doing that during Lent that's kind of new and different. Uh, but as Chris coined this phrase here a week or two ago, it's old school Methodist. So we're going back to doing old school Methodist, at least here through Lent, where we sing the Gloria Patra. You know, and so this Sunday, when we sing the Gloria Patra, uh, I'll lead you in that, but it's after the Lord's Prayer, and I uh, want you to all rise and sing that. So anyway, just be ready for that when it comes in the service. And that's all I have for you this morning. Oh yeah, the book study is at 5 o'clock tonight on the Methodist Class Band.
right after church. Yeah, right after church, Dave. Yep. Good morning. If you can stand and join me in the call to worship, please. Oh God, my God, we seek you. Our spirits long for you. But your love, oh God, is better even than life. Let us seek the Lord where God may be found. We will bless you as long as we live. Okay. If you can open your hymnals to 788, please. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. 381. may be seated. We're going to read the responsive reading from Psalm 63, 1 through 8. You can find it in your hymnal on 788 or follow along on the screen. And we start out with all of us. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. O God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where no water is. Though I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. My soul is feasted as within marrow and fat, 
and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I think of you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help and in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. Let us pray. O God, you've made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off, to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord God, here today, as war rages on in the Ukraine, Lord, I can't stand it. Uh, I just uh, can't imagine what your people are going through in the Ukraine. Lord, and they didn't ask for this. They didn't provoke it. They just are on the receiving end of it. So, Lord God, I pray for peace in the Ukraine. I pray that you change the heart of their attackers. I pray that you would cover them with, you know, as a nation, with your blood. And just lift them up and care about them and pray for them. Lord, uh, 
There are people of all faiths in that country. And Lord, they love you. It's a peace-loving country. They don't deserve this. So Lord, I too, earnestly, we join together our hearts and hands and we raise up a standard against that evil that is attacking them and just claim victory for them and that peace would re again return. Lord, for us, we grumble and we complain because we have to pay more for gasoline. And Lord, I know that paying more for that gasoline does create a hardship on folks. But Lord, we repent for thinking of ourselves when there are those that are going through much worse crisis. Lord, so uh, uh, we, we do. We take stock of our own life and we, we repent and turn from that, Lord. So, Lord, with these things in mind, we lift up the precious name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. be seated. This morning's sermon scripture is from Luke chapter 13, and I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 9, and depending on how much time we have to get to ball games this afternoon. We may continue on from verse 10. We'll see well, how, the, how the Lord leads us this morning. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all the Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Verse 6, parable of the barren fig tree. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. These scriptures that I read to you, uh, you know, unless it's a prescribed uh, 
sermon series like Nehemiah or Hebrews, where I try to go through the majority of the book, uh, these scriptures are in what's called uh, the lectionary. And the lectionary is a group of readings that are predetermined that try to follow the liturgical calendar. And so we're in Lent. Uh, and I like to think that when I follow the lectionary, you never know what the Holy Spirit has for us. And I believe that this morning's scriptures and this message was uh, thought about for us by God weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Uh, God knew what we need here, and so may the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing in God's sight, and that the things that I have to say here this morning are the things that God would have us hear for us today. So, going to verse 1, uh, the background story here is Jesus is at Capernaum in Galilee, and Capernaum is uh, on the Sea of Galilee, Galilee, up on the north and west corner uh, of Galilee. It's a fishing town uh, and uh, kind of a merchant town. It's kind of a thriving little town there that Jesus has taken up residence there. And he's preaching in the synagogue. Well, after Jesus gets done preaching, these group of people come and, and ask Jesus about these Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. And then he asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? So what Luke is talking about here, as far as we know, is Pilate, uh, as the governor in Jerusalem, had a water problem. And so one of the good things that Pilate uh, tried to do is get a, an aqueduct system going for Jerusalem. And, uh, and, and so that was a good thing that Pilate did. The bad thing is Pilate didn't have the money to pay for it, so he robbed the temple of their money and used the temple's money uh, to pay for it. Well, these Galileans were kind of a, they've always been throughout history, sort of a rebellious lot, and none of them liked Roman occupation. None of them liked Pilate, and as far as they were concerned, Pilate was stealing God's money to pay for this aqueduct system. And so as Pilate is addressing uh, this crowd, Pilate has his henchmen uh, uh, spaced throughout the crowd incognito with weapons, so if they're starts to be an un, you know a, a mob uh, type uh, insurrection, if you will there, that these henchmen could pull out their knives and daggers and quickly put down any uprising or any rioting. And so lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. And these Galileans were right in the middle of all of that. And they were kind of the instigators of all of that. And so it got out of hand. It even got out of hand more than what Pilate really wanted to happen. Uh, he wanted to quickly and quietly put it down. Well, it didn't happen that way. And so these Galileans 
were killed and thrown on the uh, altar in the temple where, where their blood uh, mingled and mixed with the blood of the sacrifices, which was kind of, which was an abomination. Uh, it was one of the worst things that you could do. So when these guys are asking Jesus about this, Jesus says to them, do you think that, you know, why did this have to happen like this? And these guys were trying to ask if there was a cause and effect between the Galilean sin and the way they ended up dying. And Jesus' response was, no. There, uh, let's see, it says, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Then Jesus brings the story of uh, the Tower of Siloam up to them, and he asks them of those 18 who were killed in the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? And Jesus' answer to that was no. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. So what Jesus is saying here is uh, whether this, it's a man-made tragedy or whether it is uh, something that just happens, there's no cause and effect because of someone's sin that they have to die. It's, there's no relationship there. But here's the deal, folks. Uh, and I think this is what Jesus is trying to tell them, that we all are going to perish at some point in time unless the Lord comes again, you know, and, and takes his church home with him. I'm picking on Chris a little bit today, you know, with because I like some of the things that he says, you know, uh, you know, old school Methodist. I really like that. But we were at Pizza Hut the other day, and I was kind of sharing with Chris and uh, Bob and Phyllis. I do believe that we are kind of in the end times. You know, and then Chris says, well, should I go ahead and have my taxes made this year? <laughs> So, yeah, you need to go have your taxes made, and hopefully the Lord uh, comes before you have to write the check out. But we're all going to perish. We're not going to get out of this life alive. So Jesus is making a case here for us to constantly be thinking about our life and rethink. The definition of repent is to rethink our life. And it's not just a one and done deal, folks, because we all uh, come short. We all sin. And we all need to let the Holy Spirit clean that up in us. So here's Jesus saying, he's talking about spiritual death. When he says, I tell, unless you repent, you will all perish, just as they did. The second part of this scripture is the parable of the fig tree. There was this man who owned a vineyard, and in the middle of it, there, it wasn't unusual for different kinds of trees to just grow up within a vineyard. And so there was a fig tree in the middle of this vineyard, and... Um, the man who owned the vineyard was disgusted with it because he'd been looking forward to having figs off that fig tree. Well, it had been over three years, that fig tree 
never produced one fig. And so it made the vineyard owner mad, and he told the gardener, that tree is not bearing any fruit. It's just taking up precious soil, and uh, it is no earthly good to us. Just cut it down. We can use it for firewood. Uh, just get rid of it. Well, the gardener made an intercession on behalf of fig tree. My sermon title was Save the Fig Tree. So this, the gardener said to the landowner, the orchard owner, or vineyard owner, give me another year with it. Let me, uh, I'll dig a trench around it. I'll put some fertilizer around it. Maybe we can water it so that the water will get down to the roots. Let's see what happens with it. Let's, let's give it another chance and, and just kind of see what happens. I like to compare this to our cattle ranchers and farmers. Those of you that have had cows, sometimes you, you have a, an aging cow that comes up what we call open, which means she isn't pregnant. Well, you still have to feed her. And so she is, uh, uh, you know, she's a drain on your profitability. And, you know, she's not going to make any money for you this year. So you're faced with a choice. You can either sell her, get rid of her, or you can give her another chance. Uh, when I was in the cattle business, I had a partner. There was a little source of contention between us on how to manage these ca this cow herd. I wanted to have the vet come out and pregnancy test him every year. And, uh, you know, if we had any open cows, I didn't want to pay for them. Uh, I didn't want to give them another chance. Well, my partner, for one thing, <laughs> he'd say, well, you know, a pregnancy test, that's the bull's job. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of good management there. Uh, and then the next thing is, you know, he just wanted to let them old cows die out there, you know, get so old that they would die. You know, and he couldn't bring himself to selling those old cows. Well, anyway, we made it work. We, but anyhow, there was... It's kind of like my partner was sort of interceding for these cows. Let's go ahead and keep them and give them another chance. I'm just deciding whether I should go to verse 10 or not right now. Becky says, go for it. And now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, do not teach it. Do not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox on, or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water. And not, not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day. When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. Let's see if we can put these three separate stories all together 
that build on one another. First of all, Jesus has said, uh, when he's posed with a question, is there a cause and effect between these folks dying and sin in their life? Is there a relationship there? And Jesus says, absolutely none. There is no cause and effect there. But we all come up short. We all want to live eternally. So we all have to repent at times. We all have to be on our guard. And just as the parable of the fig tree and the gardener has made intercession for that tree that didn't bear any fruit so that we have to rethink our lives and repent so that we will bear fruit. So what fruit are we talking about? Well, the fruits of the Spirit is a place to start. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, uh, long-suffering, uh, joy. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. If our lives are not uh, showing forth those fruits, is God just going to cut us down? Is there a cause and effect between that and uh, our longevity in life? Absolutely none. But yet, Jesus is making intercession for each and every one of us all the time. He's saying, consider, consider, consider. And it's up to us to be the gardeners of one another, to watch out over one another in love, to repent and to rethink our own lives so that we bear fruit, so that we uh, can uh, enjoy uh, our place in the vineyard, so that we uh, have fertile ground and that we get our roots become watered. We need to invest in one another, just as the gardener invested his time and energy into the fruit tree. Finally, this woman who had this disease for 18 years and was stooped over, and Jesus touched her, and she was healed. It was a supernatural power of God that was released into her life, and her life was forever changed. And so it is with you that the supernatural power of God wants to change you. The supernatural power of God wants to uh, <laughs> make you change you from being a barren fig tree to being this fruitful uh, Christian. We have to repent. We have to constantly rethink our lives. There's always going to be detractors. It seems like that's kind of a major theme in, in Luke. So there's always going to be detractors. There were these uh, priests that, uh, in the synagogue that came back and said to Jesus, how dare you heal somebody on the Sabbath? How dare you do that? That is against the law. And, um, you know, there's six other days that you could come and be healed. Why do you have to pick the Sabbath? Jesus is telling those people, you think more of your, your oxen and your donkeys than you think of this woman. You think more about your pets than you do this woman. Because, you know, you wouldn't let your ox or your donkey, uh, you know, be in harm's way during the Sabbath. So why isn't it appropriate 
it's actually most appropriate for healing to take place on the Sabbath. So when the supernatural power of God comes into your life, you don't have to get all hung up on rules and regulations. You don't know how the Spirit of the Lord is going to move, uh, is going to reach down within you, and rivers of living water may come gushing out. Just be open to that. Just be open to the refreshing of the Spirit. Be open to healing. You may think that, you know, I've, I've lived so long, these aches and pains, and it's just going to be my way of life from now on. Don't limit God. Don't limit God to uh, uh, that's your lot in life. It's not a lot, but it's my life. The supernatural power of God, just as he healed this woman, wants to heal you of whatever is going on, your physical ailments, wants to heal you of your emotional uh, hurts and pains that you're experiencing. Don't let anybody else tell you that, well, that's, that's out of order here for us today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Our final hymn is God of Grace and God of Glory. There is no hymnal page number to this. It's on the screen. So stand if you will. Brothers and sisters, keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, let all that you do be done in love.